Matthias Johansson, CEO of Dirac Research, and I have been talking about room correction, impulse response, frequency response, getting pretty geeky here, but after all, that is the name of the show. Um, and I also wanted to talk about uh, Dirac's work on speaker correction. We've been talking a lot about room correction, but there is also, you've been doing quite a bit of work in the other piece of the puzzle that you mentioned early in the show, which is how to correct the performance of a speaker within the speaker. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about what you're doing in that regard. And I know we've got a couple pictures of a couple products that actually use it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, essentially, the, the problem is it's kind of similar to, to room correction <clears throat> from a signal processing point of view. Again, you know, we're interested in improving the impulse response and the frequency response of, of the speaker. Um, so uh, we've always believed that uh, it also would be possible to design uh, speakers in a more unconventional way. Uh, because, for example, what what is a problem with, with a traditional speaker design is obviously that you need to match the the driver to the to the cabinet, the size of the cabinet, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but with uh, that, that's one of the you know obvious problems, if you like, uh, when you want to create a small speaker but still with good bass response. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at at the digital signal processing, there are certain things that we cannot do there. Uh, for example, we cannot change the directivity, the dispersion characteristics of a speaker, and uh, and and if the speaker has poor power handling, there's not much we can do about that either, um, and. One of the uh, uh, one of the speakers that uh, we uh, had a part in in building was with another Swedish company, a, a small hi-fi company called XTC. Um, they they built a small computer speaker a few years back uh, using our uh, impulse response and frequency response correction. And what they did differently was that they really built it from grounds up. Being considered, uh, being designed for use only with DSP, and not uh, first building a great analog speaker and then adding DSP on top of it. Uh, and the result is quite interesting because that speaker in itself, without the DSP, if you take away the DSP, it sounds quite bad actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the whole point in a sense, because with DSP, it's it's really I would say class leading. Um, it, it's a computer speaker. It has some. Um, uh, a small three-inch driver, full-range driver at the front. Uh, and since it's a full-range driver, it has, it actually acts uh, like, almost like a point source. It, ha it, is, it has very good dispersion. And that's and important. And you don't, you don't have the difference between uh, the, 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 you don't have the time delay problem between a two-way speaker, a woofer and a tweeter. Yep. Uh, and, and of course, uh, with with that, you know, designing a good full bandwidth speaker is quite hard. So you're not going to get that without having some some compromises uh, mm -hmm. in your in your <clears throat> frequency response. For example, you get some resonances. But with good uh, dispersion characteristics, what that means is that the frequency response and also the impulse response will be the same or very similar, at least. Uh, in in various positions throughout the room. So whether I'm I'm off 45 degrees or whether I'm in, straight in front of the speaker won't matter so much. And that of course is great for for digital correction because I cannot change uh, the, the the dispersion characteristics, but I can change that average behavior. And if the behavior is same in different positions, then I will get a good response everywhere. Um, so that's that's. One of the things. The other thing that was very unconventional uh, in this speaker was that they actually added another driver, a woofer, in spite of, of the first small driver being uh, full band. Uh, this is a down firing woofer, actually. Um, and the reason was that the cabinet, the box of the speaker, is really too small. You can't fit this woofer anywhere but in the bottom of the speaker mm. uh, we have a picture we have a picture of the speaker i think you're talking about the mh800 dsp right, right yeah that's right this this is the one um and you can see actually 
<clears throat> it's, it, you cannot see the down firing woofer, but it's you can see a small. It almost looks like a port, right, in in the front of the speaker at this at, at the, the bottom, uh, yeah, bottom there, yeah. So that's where the air comes out. Um, now, as the woofer there is just as big as it can uh, to even to just fit there, it doesn't match at all with the cabinet size. So that leads to some pretty terrible resonances again. Uh, <clears throat> and moreover, uh, the decision was made to use a 6 dB crossover between those two drivers, which isn't very steep, obviously, and uh, would normally not be the best choice. Uh, so, so the speaker without the DSP has a lot of problems. It has huge amounts of resonances, actually. <clears throat> but it was designed for DSP. So it has good power handling. These drivers were also optimized <clears throat> by the company making the drivers so that we would handle power well. So mm -hmm. after we apply the, the DSP, we, we can correct for the problems that this um, 6 dB crossover created. We can, we can compensate for all the frequency domain and time domain problems of the small full range. And we can also get rid of the resonances from the box combined with the big woofer. What we also can do is, since we have a big woofer in, in, uh, in the bottom of the speaker, we can actually move a lot of air. So if we just have enough power in the amp, we can boost the bass a lot. And in the end, we actually ended up with, with this speaker being able to play down to 40 hertz. And as you can see here on the image, it's not a very big speaker. No. Uh, <clears throat> And it has. And we do have we do have a frequency response picture as well of the speaker before and after, I believe. Yeah, uh, let's take exactly. a look at that one. There it is. So this is you're just seeing an an, an average response here, and and also a, in an anechoic chamber. Um, as you can see, the, the black line on the top is is that analog speaker without any correction, and mm. and let's uh, and I mean that's not uh, a well renowned hi-fi manufacturer would release to the market, obviously. But the whole point here was to build a speaker that should sound good with DSP. And the result is, is quite remarkable. Also, because of this um, full range speaker, you have very good dispersion. So the imaging is, is fantastic with the speaker and it's not sens very sensitive to where you're seated when you're listening to the speaker. And this is just one example of a speaker that was built according to these ideas. And there's so much more there that I think will be explored, uh, has been explored to, to a certain extent, but will be explored more in the future. Uh, <clears throat> of course, this was just touching on, on what I would call linear signal processing speaker correction. When you go to very small speakers, it becomes important to also use nonlinear techniques because then you have um, problems with just getting enough uh, sound pressure level and you're pushing the speaker so it distorts. So we're actually these days also working on uh, on, on micro speakers for, for smartphones. So we're, we're licensing our technology to, to smartphone manufacturers as well. Mm. There the goal, of course, is very far from what we're used to, where we're used to getting the best sound systems in the world to sound a little bit better, uh, to be as close to perfect as possible. In a smartphone, we're just trying to get a rather crappy sound system <laughs> to begin with to sound decent anyway. Uh, but it's it's a step in the right direction. And we're now getting out, getting to the point where with, with these both linear and nonlinear techniques, we're getting sound there, which which actually it starts to to um, to cause some uh, <clears throat> you know, portable speaker manufacturers to think that, oh, these small portable speakers might go out of the market because the smartphones are getting better and better and they're getting stereo sound and they're getting louder. And actually nowadays they're getting uh, at least uh, a decent sound quality out of them. So, I, I, I mean, that's something we're very happy to be part of because in the end, that's why we started the company. We wanted to be uh, we wanted to improve the sound quality of, of whatever sound system really uh, out there. And of course, we, we, we initially focused a lot on the very advanced sound systems. And that's where, where we still put a lot of energy. But 
it's really great to see also in these mass market products that you're getting a better and cleaner sound experience these days.